So in today's session, we'll be answering the question, how is the burden of indirect taxation shared between consumers and producers? Now, indirect tax is a tax which is levied on goods and services rather than on income or profit. So the most common example of an indirect tax would be input duties. Other examples would be sales tax, per unit tax, value added tax or VAT, goods and services tax or GST as we know it, and excise tariff, etc. Now, an indirect tax is a tax which is collected by an intermediary from a person who bears the ultimate economic burden of the tax, but that does not necessarily mean that the only that only one economic party out of buyers and sellers pays the entire burden of the taxation. So indirect tax is a type of tax where the incidence and impact of taxation does not fall on the same uh, entity. So there might be people, like the buyers and sellers, both of them can share the incidence of tax, but it will only be collected by the intermediary from the person who bears the ultimate economic burden of the tax. We'll discuss more about it in this session and it'll become clearer through the session. So um, another thing that I need to say is the incidence is essentially based on which of the two is more price elastic. So uh, if the buyer in, if the buyer who is present in the market is more uh, elastic to changes in prices, then he'll, sh uh, he'll pays a lesser share of the tax. So he'll be relieved from the burden of tax. The more elastic he is to the changes in the price, the less he will have to pay, the less he will have to face the incidence of tax. So the expression for tax incidence involves elasticities of demand and supply. So before you move on to this chapter, I'd suggest if you have a revision of the elasticities of demand and supply. Now let's consider a situation as follows of the market situation basically. So we have plotted on the vertical axis price and on the on the horizontal axis, we have the quantity supplied and the quantity demanded. So as usual, we have a downward sloping demand curve. And let's say that the market supply curve is given by SS1, which is uh, as usual, obviously upward rising. So by the interaction of the demand curve and the supply curve, we can see that the market equilibrium is attained at a point E1 where the price, market price of good OQ1, OQ1 good is supplied in the market and as it is the equilibrium point, OQ1 is equal to the quantity demanded, equal to the quantity supplied in the market and OP1 is the equilibrium price. So that is the price that uh, enables quantity demanded to be equal to quantity supplied. So this is the e initial equilibrium situation that we have. Now let's say there's a tax of dollar T imposed per unit of production. Note that there's a per unit production. So what happens essentially is, let's say uh, the production cost of each unit of good is let's say $5. And now the government imposes a one, $1 taxation on each unit of production. So right now the total cost of production essentially becomes $6 because the producer will have to pay $5 for the production of the good itself and he'll have to pay $1 extra to the government. So the total production cost itself becomes $6. So what happens is the final MC, the marginal cost is increased. There's an increase in the final marginal cost of the uh, good and the increase is basically by the amount which is equal to the tax imposed on the good. So the initial marginal cost, which was $5, plus the tax that has been imposed, which is $1, equal a final marginal cost. So the marginal cost is essentially the addition of the initial marginal cost and the tax. So this final marginal cost is now $6. Now, for a perfectly competitive market, we know that marginal cost curve is nothing but the market supply curve. We know that the upward rising portion of the marginal cost curve, which lies above the shutdown point, is essentially the supply curve of a firm in a competitive market. So if this is the equation which says final MC2 is equal to initial MC1 plus T, then this MC2 is nothing but the final supply curve. And this MC1 is essentially this SS1, which we discussed before. So we can convert this equation and we can write final supply curve SS2. That is, we denote the final supply curve as SS2. That is nothing but the initial supply curve SS1, which we have in this diagram, plus some vertical distance T. So what we essentially have is this initial supply curve SS1 has faced a vertical shift by a distance equal to the tax. 
so this ss1 curve which is the mar which is kind of the marginal cost curve this marginal cost curve shifts upward to a new marginal cost mc2 so there's a shift in the supply curve of the firm by a vertical distance t so initially the equilibrium was this point but now that the supply curve has shifted to ss2 we consider this to be the relevant supply curve of the market so our equilibriums and our equilibrium quantities change naturally now initially we had equilibrium e1 but now the equilibrium will be at point e2 because at this e2 point the demand curve dd dash intersects the relevant current supply curve ss2 pertaining to this uh, equilibrium point we have the market price as opd which is uh, the market equilibrium price where the quantity demanded and quantity supplied is equal to oq2 now as you can see initially the quantity demanded and quantity supplied was oq1 but right now the quantity demanded and quantity supplied is oq2 so now the so if it very obvious result is as a result of taxation the quantity which is demanded and supplied in the market the equilibrium quantity gets reduced so there's a decrease in the quantity of the quantity transacted in the market essentially so this is basically the setup now we'll be analyzing and bringing forth price elasticities into our picture so let's discuss the price elasticities now the price elasticity of demand is an economic measure of the change in the quantity demanded or purchased of a product in relation to its price change so we have ed equals delta qd by qd into pd by delta pd we can again write it as delta qd by delta pd into pd by qd whichever suits you so at this point e2 we find that the delta qd is essentially the change in the quantity demanded of that good so that's essentially e1 e3 this is a change that the, uh, the the change in the quantity demanded of the good so that's e1 e3 and the quant uh, and the quantity demanded a change in the price of that good so we take this expression going by this expression the denominator will be change in the price of the good so change in the price would be this change and that is what we have written e2 e3 and the pd pd represents the initial price and qd represents initial quantity so this will be op1 which was the original price and oq1 which was the original quantity so this is ed this is the elasticity of demand next we move on to the elasticity of supply so the price elasticity of supply is a measure used in economics to show the responsiveness or elasticity of the quantity supplied or of a good or service excuse me a change in its price so similar to before the price elasticity of supply is represented by uh, delta qs by qs into ps by delta ps or we can again represent it as delta qs by delta ps into ps by qs again whichever suits you so uh, if let me just erase this part So in in this situation, we have delta Q S to be e one e three, which is still the quant change in the quantity demanded. However, the change in the price of the good this time will be this because you see, as uh, you might be wondering by the labels that I put here, P B essentially O P B rather essentially represents the price that the buyer pays. On the other hand, O P S is essentially the price that the sellers receive. now elasticity of demand and elasticity of supply deal with two separate uh, parts of the market so elasticity of demand demand is essentially uh, from the side of the buyers and supply or yeah supply is essentially from the side of the sellers so when we are talking about elasticity of demand we need to consider the part of the market which deals with buyers and when we talk about elasticity of supply we talk about that part of that segment of the market essentially which deals with sellers so when we are talking about elasticity of demand we consider more of the pb part because it deals with the buyers part of the market on the other hand elasticity of supply when when we are considering elasticity of supply it needs to correspond to the ps uh, price which is essentially the price that the sellers receive so that is essentially the distinguishing point between the price that we consider when we are talking about ed and the price that we consider when we are talking about es so using those uh, concepts 
<coughs> sorry, we can find out that ES is equal to E1, E3 by E3, E4. And the original price and quantity essentially remains the same as that of the initial equilibrium E1. So we still get OP1 by OQ1. So that is how we get the expressions for ED and ES. Next, we uh, just write down what we had. Initially, the price paid by buyers was equal to the price received by sellers. So if we move back to the diagram, at the initial equilibrium E1, OP1, was the price which was both paid by buyers and received by sellers. Because whatever the price was paid by buyers, it was the sellers would receive that price. OP1 was that price which was paid by buyers as well as received by sellers. Now what happens is, as I mentioned before, the production cost has increased and it has transformed to OPB. There's a shift in the uh, supply curve which has allowed the marginal cost of OQ2 production to be OPB. So this is the production cost and this is the price which is paid by buyers. So o, for, for OQ2 transaction of goods and services, the buyers pay the uh, sellers upon a price of OPB. So the price paid by buyers is essentially OPB. However, the price received by sellers is actually OPS because out of this OPB amount of price, this section T, this section goes to the government because the government has imposed a tax of T dollars. So this section, the seller has to give away this section of the price to the government. So he's essentially left with OPS. Although the buyer pays an amount OPB, the seller is left with only an OPS. So this is the price which is received by sellers, OPS. Now, if you see SB, I have denoted SB as the share of tax incidence on buyers. Now, if this is the entire tax portion, the part E3, E4 is essentially the difference between the price that the sellers were initially receiving and the price that they receive now. So P1, PS represents the loss in the price, that loss in the amount rather that sellers receive. Again, P1, PB, which I have represented as a share of tax incidence on buyers. So P1, PS is the tax incidence on sellers. P1, PB is the tax incidence on buyers. So this is the tax incidence on sellers. This is the tax incidence on buyers. So P1, PB is essentially the increase that in the price that buyers have to pay. Initially, the buyers were paying OP1 for procurement of OQ1. But now they have to pay OPB for procurement of OQ2. Nonetheless, there has been a quantity uh, it decrease in the quantity of transaction. However, the buyers need to pay more. So P1, PB is that portion of the tax that is faced by buyers. Uh, yeah, and P1, PS is that portion of the tax which is faced, faced by sellers. Now, if I use this expression ED by ES, if I go back, ED by ES will essentially become E1, E3 will get cancelled. OP1, OQ1 will get cancelled and ED by ES will essentially boil down to E3, E4 by E2, E3. So we have ED by ES equal to E3, E4 by E2, E3. Now, if we look into this expression E3, E4 by E2, E3 and we compare it to the diagram that we had before, E3, E4 is essentially this segment which is equal to P1, PS. So what we do is we replace E3, E4 with P1, PS and similarly E2, E3 is the upper segment which is equal to P1, PB. Now, as I had mentioned before, P1, PB is that part of the tax which is faced by buyers and P1, PS is that part of the tax which is faced by sellers. So as you can see, this ratio ED by ES is essentially the ratio of the share of the tax incidence on sellers and the share, and the share of the tax incidence on buyers. So this gives us a very uh, good expression for the ratio of the shares. We can find out which share is or which... Uh, Agent of the market, seller or buyer, pays the greater share of the uh, tax incidence. However, let us now find out an explicit expression which gives us the perfect value of SS and SB, not in ratio form, but in explicit value form. 